Afternoon, everyone. My name is Mike Kanan, and I am the COO of Stranger's Guide. We're an award-winning publication that commissions stories from local writers and photographers to build authentic portraits of place from Scandinavia and Tehran to Colombia and Lagos. Learn more about what we do at strangersguide.com or connect with me after the session. I'm very pleased to introduce today's panel. Jim Van de Hey is a co-founder and CEO of Axios, a media company focused on breaking news and invaluable insights across politics, tech, business, media, and the world. As CEO, Van de Hey has steered Axios into becoming one of the most celebrated digital media success stories of the past few years, including overseeing the launches of Axios Local and Axios HQ. Before Axios, Van de Hey co-founded and was CEO of Politico. Esmitra Kalita is a co-founder and CEO of URL Media, a network of black and brown news and information outlets that share content, revenue, and distribution. She also is publisher of Epicenter NYC, a community journalism initiative in Queens. A veteran journalist, Mitra most recently worked at CNN and is the author of two books. Charles Hudson is the managing partner and founder of Precursor Ventures, an early stage venture capital firm focused on investing in the first institutional round of investment for the most promising software and hardware companies. Charles was previously a partner at SoftTech VC and held roles at Bionic Panda Games, Serious Business, Gaia Interactive, and Google. Pam Wasserstein is the president of Vox Media, the leading independent modern media company, where she oversees strategic initiatives including e-commerce and consumer business, as well as the New York Magazine brands. Prior to 2019 merger with Vox Media, she had been the CEO of New York Media, leading premium media brands New York Magazine, Vulture, The Cut, Intelligencer, Grub Street, and The Strategist. Please join me in welcoming everyone to the stage. everyone, it's great to be with you. Um, it's really great to be in person. This is my kind of early in the game here, but um, it's just been so wonderful to connect with so many of you. Um, so connection is what we'll be doing as well today. 86% um, of Americans now get their news from digital media and digital sources, and have had to, the media industry has had to keep up with their consumption and um, innovate ways to sustainability and profitability like never before. So media companies have also had to reassess our own role uh, to remain competitive in this incre increasingly competitive landscape. Um, I usually approach moderation in moderation, um, and we'll try to do that today, because for the challenges before us, I could not think of a better group uh, to really dive into some of these issues. Um, I do want to just mention that you can submit questions through the app. Um, if that's glitchy for any reasons, I've been assured that we can um, have time for Q&A um, in the room, but we really do want to try to get to your questions through the app, which will be monitored, and then I'll be able to read them out loud and um, ask our panelists um, for their thoughts. Um, so, as promised, I, I really do just want to dive right in. I'm going to start, Jim, with you. Um, to understand the title of what we're discussing, this new era of the digital media business. I'm wondering if you can tell us what we've left behind, where we are now, and where it's going. And you have We're to do that, do that briefly, right? in <laughs> bullet <laughs> points, <laughs> Jim. <laughs> I mean, I think what we've left behind is you know, 15 years of experimentation. A lot of it probably misguided, but not for wrong reasons. I think people figured it out over the last 10 or 15 years. I think where we're at right now for the first time, so my background is we started Politico 15 years ago, started Axios five years ago, so we've kind of been in the middle of this storm. I'd say where we're at now is I love the trend that you have more and more journalists becoming founders, that you have more and more people who are serious about journalism finally trying to figure out the business side. For too, too long, it was just like they were separate, right? And I think it really hurt trying to figure out viable, durable, scalable, uh, media businesses. And where we're going from here, who the hell knows? I, I don't know. I, I do know that there's a, a thirst for high quality information. I know that there is, uh, I think, kind of a movement that was at first subtle, now strong, of people wanting a cleaner, safer place to get their information than on social media. And I know that there's a lot of really good businesses being built 
that can serve a lot of these communities. There's still tough ones to figure out. We're trying to figure out local. People are trying to figure out accountability journalism uh, at scale other than outside of, of Washington. But I'm more bullish today than I've been in the last 15 years about journalism. Can I just ask you a follow-up on yeah. that? You launched two companies. Uh, Politico was 2000, help me what year it was. Seven. 2007, just sold for more than a billion dollars in uh, this, this past fall. Um, in launching each of those companies, kind of your um, framework of the editorial side versus the business side, what is one key difference in launching Politico versus launching Axios? Kind of the landscape then versus today. One, I had no right launching Politico, and I was terrible in the beginning. And by the time we did Axios, I was pretty good at it, I think, right? You learn from doing this. I mean, we were journalists who you put our journalism skills to work to try to figure out how do you run a company in a wild, hyper-competitive environment. So we luckily, with Politico, we had a good idea. It took off, and we had several years to repair ourselves so that we could repair uh, the company. But once you're in it, and once you've run these things, it's, it's a really fun space. Like, if you can get into it either as an investor or as an operator uh, or as someone who runs it, I mean, it's an exciting space. It's content. People care about it. It makes a difference uh, in people's lives. It's dynamic. Uh, it's hard, but it's fun. Um, Pam, I'm wondering if we can bring you into the conversation. So last week, you announced a new leadership of Vox Media. And in reading kind of the list of folks who are group publishers and publishers, I was just struck that how quickly Vox has moved from being you know, a relatively flat um, digital organization into this matrixed media empire of a magazine, a website, and now with uh, the addition of Group 9, you know, a video powerhouse between now this news and some of the other brands. So can you tell us about that evolution and also how you would how would you characterize your business model today? Um, yeah, empire is kind of a lofty descriptor. <laughs> but I'm not sure I go that far. I, mean, but, I run um, a newsletter in Queens, so it's an empire. <laughs> I just want to I just want to be clear on my perspective. Uh, but um, we I describe our business model as we um, are focused on a diversified, sustainable business built around strong media brands um, and a multi-brand platform. Uh, portfolio uh, where there's connection around, um, you know, passionate audiences and real authority. Um, but, and we monetize um, those, those brands and those audience relationships through a variety of means. And um, another lens on your earlier question, too, of like what's changed, I think some of those business opportunities, monetization opportunities have matured over the last, you know, five, 10 years. And um, so something like digital subscriptions, for example, which had been nascent, you know, that is now a significant opportunity for us and for other publishers too. Uh, our podcast business um, is, you know, audiences were there for a while and advertisers less so, and now not just uh, direct response advertisers, but brand advertisers are really interested in um, reaching podcast audiences, for example. Um, you know, we're active on social platforms, and there, too, we're able to monetize, which was not always the case for publishers. So I, I think there, there's been this mix of um, maturation of the market opportunities. Um, and for our company, as you said, we, we've grown quite a bit. We've grown through acquisition as well as organically. Um, I, I came to the company through New York Magazine, um, which merged with Vox Media two, two years and a bit ago, just before the pandemic. Um, and we recently acquired Group 9, too. So we're now, like we were saying, uh, in the an green empire. room. empire. I'm sorry. I said an empire. I mean, the, and do you take exception to that because you still feel like there's growth? Do you feel we're like, like We're just getting started. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's fair. Um, and just... One quick follow-up to what you were just characterizing. It feels like the pendulum um, kind of shifts wildly between the centralization. So for example, Group 9 and its video mm -hmm. uh, capabilities. Are you seeing that as an individual um, unit? Is that going to enhance capability across the suite of products that you just mentioned? How are you thinking about that? We, it's interesting. Um, group 9, actually, New York Media Vox Media and, and now Group 92 are all actually organized pretty similarly in the sense that there's a centralized infrastructure. So uh, one, you know, 
marketing and advertising team, one product and technology design team uh, across a multi-brand portfolio. And so we've continued uh, with this most recent merger integration, we've continued that um, structure and you know, centralized like core services, finance and uh, people and culture and things like that. Um, so, so there is a lot of matrixiness in mm -hmm. the sense that within those uh, centralized teams, there are people who are more focused on the, the business that's the primary business for one of our specific for brands. Each of the units of yeah. Brand. So in that way, you know, that's that's the way we can uh, kind of bring leverage uh, capabilities developed, business capabilities developed for one area. Like a good example um, might be affiliate e-commerce. Like uh, the New York brand, The Strategist, has a is a primarily a affiliate e-commerce business model. Um, it's by the way, for those who are unfamiliar with it, it's a really great uh, product recommendation. Like, if you need a gift for Mother's Day and so forth, like, go check it out. Um, this is my gift to you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but what we have learned there on the back end, both in terms of like the kinds of content that performs well uh, that you know audiences want to transact on, and then also. Um, the the kind of back end data capabilities and product capabilities that are really oriented toward a um, shopping experience. Um, we're able to bring all that. Then when we're like, hey, you know, The Verge is more interested, for example, in recommending products or helping people um, since they are already editorial recommending products buy those products that we're recommending. We're able to like leverage everything from the strategist through a centralized business team and bring it. it to the verge. So speaking of um, centralizing business models, um, Charles, three of us are media entrepreneurs. Um, one of the first things they tell you, at least this is my experience, is that Silicon Valley will not invest in media. You better come up with a technology idea if you're looking to raise money, and that's just the way that it is. So I'm wondering if you could react to that um, and then we'll, I want to ask you a, a, some follow-up on kind of what future models look like. But first, let's just start with the basics of does Silicon Valley invest in media? Not many of us do. Um, it's, it's relatively rare. I think, as Jim said, these businesses are hard, but I'm personally passionate about them and will continue to invest in them for a long time. I, I think the most important thing to remember for venture capitalists, it's not our media business is good or bad in the absolute. It's relative to the other things I could invest in. Where do media businesses stack up? And I think historically, if you look at your typical business-to-business -business software as a service company selling to enterprises, venture capitalists have a lot of experience in practice building, investing in, and scaling those business. And candidly, the thing that builds enthusiasm for investment for investors is success. And if you think about it, there aren't that many really large-scaled media properties that have taken a lot of venture capital and have come out the other end successful. There's a handful from the, the most recent generation. You know, we were first investors in The Athletic. We've been aggressive investors in the juggernaut on more of the niche media side for South Asians. We've um, also invested in some of the tooling and infrastructure, but I can absolutely tell you the companies that we invest in that are building the tooling and tech for media get much more attention from VCs than the ones that are actually creating the content themselves. So the tool, and in the, in the brands that you just mentioned, the juggernaut and the athletic among them, can you just take us through what attracted you? Um, was it a tool or technology, or and was it something else? No, it was really audience insights. Um, you know, we were first investors in the athletic, and I, I personally have a strong preference for subscription models. Um, as sort of a baseline, not the only way you can monetize. I just think it's easy for me to measure subscriber growth and you can start very small and build into something fairly large. And for the athletic, I just thought sports fans were underserved and that if you could build a premium product in sports, people would pay for it, hmm. period. And I, I thought that was a, it's interesting, we had done Bleacher Report at my old fund. And so I saw kind of the opposite take on how to build a sports empire with sort of a lot of more participatory journalism and you try to monetize it with Advertising, and so I said, hey, I want to try the opposite in this case, and you know, that one worked out pretty well for us. The juggernaut, it was more, um, you know, there was just an audience segment that I thought was deeply underserved with content around the stories and people and issues that they care about, and I said, there's so many South Asian people, not just in the United States, but across the diaspora, how come no one's built sort of the BET equivalent for this audience, like, why not? 
And so that's kind of what I look for. And then yeah. there's other weird niche things, Mitchell, that I get excited about. Like, I got really excited last year about sort of state house local political journalism as a, as a B2B business opportunity. I met a bunch of teams looking at that. So I'm always looking for people who have a unique insight on a media environment that's underserved. Huh, that's great. Um, so the good news is your questions in the app are working. I can see yep. them. Um, and speaking of um, digital uh, tools, there's a question for Jim. And I think this segues us to a little bit of media and technology and the state of affairs right now. Jim, can you explain how the Axios HQ platform is a part of your digital strategy at Axios? I just wonder if you want to first explain what that yeah, is, what is. Um, and, and you can answer that question. Yeah, so Axios HQ is essentially a, it's a AI-driven software program that helps organizations, big and small, communicate mainly internally the way that we communicate with our readers, which we call smart brevity. But the idea is how do you bring hierarchy and efficiency to content distribution in a way that engages people? And it's actually a great business story because this is not something we set out to do, but about a year and a half into having Axios, and we had some early success, we probably got a half dozen calls within about a month from Fortune 100 company executives, either the CEO or the head of marketing, saying, hey, nobody, our executives read you, but they won't read our internal stuff. Uh, will you teach us how to communicate? And at first, we're like, go to hell. You figure out how to communicate. We're a media company. Read our stuff so we can sell ads against it. Uh, but eventually, you hear enough people say it, and you're like, something's going on. And so we put our journalistic hats on and dove into these businesses. And I was kind of horrified, to be honest, at how poor uh, how, how poorly even the most sophisticated businesses communicate internally. Like they're just vomiting all of these words and these awful formats and then wondering why no one was paying attention to it. And so we pretty quickly put together a team, set up a company with inside the company, and it's been a great success. We have, I think, almost 250 companies, including a lot of Fortune 500 companies that are now communicating uh, internally using our software. It starts at about $10,000, so it's a nice reoccurring revenue line, uh, to your point. And that's what you're looking at these media companies. You're trying to figure out, can you have enough different revenue sources that you can have growth and that at least part of it is reoccurring so that you can start to make the investments with your capital uh, into a long-term, durable company. And, to Pam's point, like it's just, it's it, it, it. These things are starting to mature. We now just know a lot more. A lot of people made a lot of headway in the subscription space, which so is a lot easier to do subscriptions mm -hmm. now. I think ad buyers are getting smarter about where they should put their ads and the quality of ads and what they're putting their ads uh, against. I think it's not often that media companies have a lot of success selling technology, but you have opportunities because you have this access to both content and how people are. Uh, utilizing content and then how do you get people to pay attention to things when all of our minds are oversaturated with a mix of really good stuff and a mix of really bad stuff. Media can sell technology. Can media build technology? For sure. Like I, these, these, I hear like people say, oh, a media company can't do this or can do that. Like, tell me who the people are and tell me what the media company is, right? Mm -hmm. If you're smart and you find the right people and you have a business, I mean, the key for those that are thinking about starting a business, I always thought it was like, a pretty simple test. Like, if you have an idea, do you have a reasonable chance of being able to make that idea become an actual product? If the answer is yes, then do you have a reasonable chance of making revenue based on the known knowns within the first six months to a year? If the answer is yes to those two things and you're smart and you throw yourself into it and you're passionate about it, in all likelihood, you will be a successful company. I think what happened early on in media, if you go back, it was just all this mirage chasing. If you actually go back and read the stories, like, oh, we're going to... We're gonna, everyone's gonna pivot to video. Okay, that didn't work out. We're gonna all go to podcasts. Okay, that didn't work out. And then I know what we'll do. Let's build a company and let's hope that Facebook funds us. Let's build our entire strategy around someone else's benevolence. Well, that's insanity. So like, no wonder uh, it didn't work. Most of that stuff is washed away, by the way, and now I think businesses are run uh, in a much smarter, uh, savvier way. Pam, can media build technology? I know you. I know you all do. So tell me what you think yeah, about that. Well, we, yes, <laughs> <laughs> I do think so. Um, I I think uh, there have been some examples where a media technology, uh, sorry, a media company sort of starts to present themselves as a technology company, and I, I personally don't think that works so well. I think if it's like. Who are you kidding? You were actually in the media business, and yeah. maybe you're looking for you know a, a better multiple to be tech associate, something like that. But 
you're actually a media company and you should like lean into that and own it. Um, but I've, I've seen both at our company and at others as well, a lot of, you know, we're, we're problem solving and we are creating. And so of course, sometimes, um, at least many of us are, um, technology solutions are a part of that problem solving. And then there are many instances where you sort of like back into a tech opportunity, you know, and we built a thing for ourselves and it actually works really well. And then we built it because we looked around the market and it didn't exist and like, oh, someone else might want right. to leverage this thing that we made. Um, Charles, you have a storied background in the video game industry and we've talked about, I mean, we've sort of glossed over the various media models and I don't want to take for granted that the audience is up to date, but we've so far mentioned membership, we've mentioned subscription, we've mentioned advertising, Pam mentioned affiliate revenue. We're at an event, I think events um, are another area that mm -hmm. all of us um, on the dais have gotten into. But Charles, just from the video gaming industry, is there anything that you think digital media really could take a page out of X or um, connect those two industries for me? Yeah, I think the one, the one thing I've, Learning you know, video games, if you just think about digital monetization models, video games were really early on, sort of free to play, freemium, in app purchase. And I think the things that video games kind of figured out early that I, I don't know that every media company figured out in sort of 1.0 is if you can get people to care about and engage in your content, it's okay to let them consume a certain amount before you put a monetization offer in front of them. And I think some of the old, paywall 1.0 stuff was, it felt kind of hacky in the sense that it's like, read this one article and now pay me $10. And you're like, well, one article is not enough for me to figure out if this is something I want to pay for. And in a lot of ways, if I look at the way that some of the poorest paywalls work or the way that people have experimented with monetization in media, I think they've taken a lot of lessons from games, which is maybe a better balance between allowing the consumer to experience the product before you ask them to pay, and being creative in the ways that you ask them to pay, whether it's to become a subscriber or, hey, we have this free ad-supported podcast that you're welcome to listen to as much as you like, um, or we've got this membership model. And so I think games kind of figured this out. The thing I think media companies, by and large, haven't quite taken from games is if you look at how most free digital games monetize, it's really your top three to five percent of people paying an almost unbounded huh. amount of money. Like, you know, for a typical game, your, your whales or your biggest players might be a thou worth a thousand X what the average players were, and, and they capture those people in lots of ways. I'm only now beginning to see media companies think about what can we offer that sort of top five to 10% of our subscribers that they would both value and pay for. Like, I'm an investor in this little tiny company that no one's heard of that's building um, online digital communities around sci-fi fandom. Huh. And they are doing some really interesting work around sort of a la Comic-Con and events. I'd say, I'd argue for most media companies, events are kind of the way you end up monetizing yeah. that top tier because, because of the price point, you can give people that in-person experience. I think we're just in the early days of digital media companies figuring out how to do that as well. There's a question from the audience uh, from Steve McGarry. We make experiences for brands in the metaverse and focus on community-driven brands. What tools do you recommend for identifying community-driven brands? I just wondered if we could kind of pause and talk about brands, both the niche brands, Pam, you just rattled off a bunch of them that exist within the Vox um, umbrella, and what role the sub-brands play in the broader brand, how you're thinking about that. Um, and then, Jim, I have a specific question on Axios and that, but I just wonder, Pam, if we could begin with you. Sure. Um, I Well, the word niche can sound small mm -hmm. and you know these are brands with audiences of tens of millions so um, it's not exactly small in terms of audience but they are specific and I think in terms of building media brands the uh, specificity of what you're doing is really critical like there's so much especially um, in ad supported model like there's market pressure to grow and grow and grow sometimes by expanding the kinds of content that you create. And um, one, one thing I like about our portfolio, which is multi-brand, is it kind of reduces that pressure. I think sometimes single digital brands that cover politics are like, oh, God, we're 
there's a lot of people getting attention from Google for doing like television recaps and they kind of like edge closer and closer uh, to those non-core areas. Um, a little bit of discipline. Uh, the multi-brand model sort of enforces that discipline of like, okay, this brand, yeah, they are all about TV recaps and that's great and they're gonna own that audience and they're gonna be the primary, um, you know, if you are passionate about a, the White Lotus or something, like, you know that Vulture is where you can experience, like, all things White Lotus um, and go deep on that. And you don't need to go to, you know, Vox.com to have that kind of experience. Mm -hmm. um, that when you, when you uh, create that kind of authority, then you earn, that kind of goes back to the, uh, the niche, I guess, audience or the specific passion audience. Um, that's how you, I think, build loyalty and build really the uh, habits and behaviors that keep people coming back and yeah. back and then you're yeah. able to monetize them through a variety of ways. So I want to pivot us a little bit from the niche um, and community brands to the personal brand. And Jim, how do you think about, at least from what I've observed, Axios uh, in a relatively short amount of time has emerged as a strong brand, but your name Axios is still how you're entering local markets. You know, it, it, it yep. is, it, it seems important. Um, so talk about that. And then um, when you're hiring, are you looking at personal brands? Are you saying this person has you know, 50,000 Twitter followers, I think that's where we need to go. I mean, two things about brands. Like, I think we, Pam and I are on the opposite side uh, of the spectrum on this. Like, they have a, a huge portfolio of really good brands and have, have done well putting them all together. I'm a big believer in, in focusing on one name, one brand, that I think in a time where it's so hard to get people to feel an emotional uh, connection and a psychic connection to your brand, I'd have a hard time doing that with a bunch of brands. Whereas with one brand, it really can start to stand for something. And so everything that we build uh, under Axios would always be uh, Axios. Well, within that brand, it's about recruiting talent. Like Sarah Fisher, who's our media writer, uh, is here uh, in the audience uh, right now. And what we're looking for is not necessarily the number of Twitter followers uh, that you have. What you're looking for is somebody who has true subject matter expertise, domain expertise, and then therefore probably has a pretty big following. Mm -hmm. For us, it might be a following of people who are really powerful in a given sector, or it might be a very large uh, following. And what we want to do is create the best platform, uh, almost like HBO uh, did in the, in the golden days, as being the best place for real talent, mm -hmm. for real high-performing uh, talent, and then put everything we can into giving them the promotion uh, that we can so that they stick around and continue to do journalism with us on our platform. It's a different time, right? Like you think about Pam's company, there it's a you have talent inside of a brand, inside of a brand, right? So it's a lot of brand management. And there's no doubt that if you're a super talent right now, you have more options and more ability to make a hell of a lot more money than at any point in the history of journalism. Uh, it's, it's almost become like sports. If you're a superstar, you're going to get an Aaron Rodgers type uh, contract. If you're just a regular, you know, pretty good offensive lineman, you're not getting that. You just not. It's just the way it uh, it works. And by the way, I think that's great. I love that you have capitalism and market dynamics infusing uh, all of journalism. And I think for those few journalists, and I don't think there's that many that can command that type of audience and that kind of attention. But for those, it's it's great. And for us, it's just you've got to. There's questions here about how do you get audience trust and stuff like that. You, you, you've got to be true to what you say you are. We say we want to help you get smarter, faster on topics that matter. If we don't do that, if we don't deliver it, if it's not done in a safe, uh, well-lit area and we don't deliver the goods on a routine basis, you're just not going to come back to us and then I'm not going to have any way to monetize or grow the company. Charles, what are your thoughts on this? Because on the one hand, yeah. the brands are an attractive investment and they are also not scalable. I think. I mean, I don't know if I would agree they're not all right, scalable. But, uh, good. All right, I, 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 I guess I'm wondering, yeah. uh, well, if they go away, what becomes of the media brand? I'm thinking I, of it as a perhaps. I think most venture capital investors, most of us are not good at spotting brands. Like the, the truth is, like I think most of us are better at spotting technology trends than if, if you gave us five products and said which of these entrepreneurs is going to build the most important brand. I think. There's a handful of people that are excellent at that. I'd say on average, most of uh, most of my peers were not great at spotting that, which leads, I think, investors to be skeptical about brand. I just think about, you know, I read I read ProRata every day, 
and I've been reading Dan Primack for like my entire career as a venture capitalist. And so I think there is there are people who have these to, to Jim's point who have these followings that you will follow them wherever they go because you trust them and they have authority. Um, I think the Substack experiments and these things are really interesting because you're taking people who have tremendous writing talent and you're also saying you also have to run a business in addition to writing. And some of them who are my friends have said, wow, this running a business thing sure is a lot more work and a lot harder than I thought. Maybe this isn't the right decision for me and maybe the right decision is some balance, which is you know a home where the editorial, the tech, the payments, the, the infrastructure piece gets taken care of and I get to write, and maybe a little bit of like passion project writing on the side. But um, I, I think brands are really powerful, and I think in media you can create them pretty quickly. Like there's a bunch of people I think of as being fairly authoritative in creator economy, and that was not a word we used two and a half years ago for yeah. the most part. So I think around these new, whether it's crypto, and I think every new topic as an investor, I'm always trying to figure out who are the three or four most authoritative voices around this topic so I can follow them and get smart. There's a question uh, from David Dodson. Where does news as a public service fit into digital media business models? Charles, I'm just wondering if we could stay with you. As an investor, does that feature into um, your thinking? It does in one really particular area, and that's local, where I have probably an irrational passion <laughs> as a small venture capitalist for like trying to help address the just lack of high quality local news in many places. I think local news as a public service, as a part of democracy is really important and it's underfunded. I have not been successful at solving this problem yet, but it's something that I think is inter interesting to me both as an economic opportunity, but also as like a part of our society that like needs to exist. Pam, your thoughts on that news as a public service and where it fits into the business model? Yeah, I mean, look, we're obviously we're operating for profit business and so forth, but I, I think in our industry, a rising tide lifts all boats in a lot of ways. And the way, like, so where, you know, there are better advertising opportunities around um, digital media broadly, and that can help to support local media where it becomes easier for advertisers to transact like across multiple uh, brands, just for example. The, the relationship between publishers and platforms, you know, as we, as there are pendulum shifts there to, um, again, that, those kinds of shifts, you know, support media across the board. And I think, like you mentioned, uh, local news is obviously a really critical part of the information infrastructure for a society. But um, national news publications, too, you know, it is expensive and challenging to do um, high quality journalism. Uh, and I think it's a bit on us clearly. I'd love to see you know consumers pay more attention, and I, I yeah. do think they are increasingly. I think COVID has been um, COVID and election and war. There's uh, been these um, moments that are forcing people to pay attention to the the value of the social value of fact based journalism. Um, but it's also, it's on us probably to help educate audiences on what the difference is. Um, so it's interesting, uh, at the end of the day, like we, while we are a um, for-profit business, I think we, we do individually and collectively think about the, the social impact of what we do and take that really, really seriously. Jim, your thoughts on this question? Again, I'll just repeat it. David Dodson, where does news as a public service model fit into digital digital media business models? It is the model. Like I don't think like, public service. Like, I think really good, high quality journalism is a massive public service, particularly yeah. if you can make it available at scale for free, which uh, thankfully we've been able to do, and hopefully we'll continue to be able to do that. I, I think if you don't have great high quality content, whether it's at the local level, or at the national level, bad things happen. You've seen it. There's a lot of shit out there that people are reading. And if you can direct them to high quality content, particularly at a time where they're struggling to try to figure out how to navigate the complexities of this world, I can't think of a better 
public service. I think it's the reason people probably come to work for us and stay working for us. I think it's why people get into journalism to begin with. Like you put aside the superstar journalism, journalists, it's not like you're making a ton of money. You go to Wall Street if you want to make money, right? Or going to healthcare, something where there's just a, where a higher salary cap. If you get into journalism, you tend to get into it because you feel a calling to help either hold people accountable or help uh, inform people. That, to me, is a, is a great public service. It's why I love the media space. I think we have the most interesting space in the world. I think people like journalists, uh, for the most part, in terms of talking to them, because they tend to be wired into different subjects, and people want to know. And, you know, the good thing is, the good thing over the last year is, I think our country lost its freaking mind, right, over during the Trump years in terms of just consuming so much politics, just like an absurd amount. And this is coming from a guy who started Politico, <laughs> yeah. and I think you guys consume too much politics. But over the last year, we've seen that change. The most heartening thing was over the last two weeks, the surge in traffic around the most uh, nuanced topics about what's happening around the world, particularly uh, in, with the war in Ukraine, is just, uh, it, it, it is, uh, Awesome. It is just, I mean, people, students, old people, young people, just taking interest in topics and seeing traffic that a lot of companies haven't seen since the Trump years. And I think if people could take advantage of what I think is information nirvana, there's more good information than any point to humanity. If we could just figure out how to filter out the garbage, I think all of us are going to be better off. So if people can find news sources that do that, that's a great public service. All of us on the stage run for profit ventures. I think we're really upfront about that. What, Jim, do you make of the surge in nonprofit news models? Um, do you see that as a good thing? Do you wish that there was more innovation in the for-profit space? I mean, God bless anybody who's putting money against high quality content. If you're doing it as a not-for-profit, great. The only thing I would ask yourself is, is that are you putting money into something that can solve these problems in a durable, scalable way? I think often people, my uh, my experience in the not-for-profit world, even outside of media, is they're not all, they're not always putting the capital to places that can last forever. And I think we have really big societal problems that journalism can help fix, particularly at the local level, which is why I love the investing that you do. The and, and so the more the merrier, but I want to see more people on the for-profit side because I think there's just something about a for-profit company that does unleash an animal spirit that makes you competitive, makes you think about every dollar you spend, makes you think about it, it, it outlasting yourself that is really good. But right now, the more money we can pour in into really high-quality experimentation, the better that public service will be. Um, I just want to stay with you on that local um, Axios is entering, is it 25 cities? Yeah. Um, some with an aggregation model, right? So you're relying on local news outlets and you were using your bullet point brevity model to then deliver that news to other people. Do you feel like you owe it to local outlets to keep them in business somehow, to support their original journalism that you all then rely upon for your delivery? What, what, what do you well, make of I, that? One, I would... Uh, I would uh, that would take issue with the way you just sort of describe local. Like we hire, in every market that we've gone into, we're able to hire you know, two or three of the best reporters, start with a daily newsletter to start to create a habit, and we've done phenomenal uh, original reporting in almost every market and having a real effect, even with small teams, which shows if you have really smart journalists, give them the right tools, they can do great things at, at, at scale. What we tell people when we come into different cities, we're in 25, my hope is we'll be in 100 uh, over the next couple of years, is we come in peace. Like, I like competition. I want competition. The more, the merrier. And when we do direct somebody to, to great journalism that someone else is doing, hopefully they get traffic from it. Hopefully they get subscriptions from it. I think a healthy market should have multiple participants. And, you know, I would love to see more people getting funding so they can jump into these local markets because I do think... That, that competition is good for the soul. I really do. It's what helps us create really good products. I think it's why uh, Pam and others who've been in this now for a while and had had different brands have really started to figure it out because we were competitive with each other, mm -hmm. because we can learn 
uh, from each other. And I think the, the, the challenge for local news outlets, to be honest, is if you're running a newspaper, most of your readers are 60, 65. They're going to be dead at some point soon. And they're stuck because they're making a lot of money off the newspaper and they want to make the transition. I think the ones that make the transition smartly will do fine. I think the ones that won't die, that's markets. Hmm. Um, Charles, when we were backstage before Jim joined us, I said, do you guys invest in Axios? You said no, but I love them. Um, and I, I want you to just take us through, I asked you a version of this before. Why did you say that, right? What is it about the company yeah. that uh, kind of prompted that response from you? Un I just unprompted. Think it's, and then yeah. um, what metrics are you using to say this is a successful business? This is where I want to go. I just think it's a really well done media property. It delivers on its value prop. I read, I read Sarah's news. I read, I read several. I read the health one. I read um, Peretta. I read social. I just think the writing it's consistent. The style is consistent across. And I think as a reader, it's easy to get comfortable with a product where you're like, I know what I'm going to get in this new vertical, even though I don't necessarily either know the journalist or know the subject matter. I know that it's going to deliver on this smart. Brevity. So you know what you're going to get. That, you know what you're that's, gonna, that's important. Okay. You know what you're going to get. Um, it's high quality and it's timely. And I think it takes, honestly, a lot of courage to start a media company. I think I was joking around. If you're a first time media entrepreneur and you go around and ask a lot of your friends, should I start a venture back media company? They will tell you no. They will tell you unambiguously you should not do this. And I, I think that that mindset keeps a lot of smart people from taking experiments and taking chances. And to Jen's point, we need more experimentation around business model. Like I'm, I was very excited about a lot of these kind of more journalist collective type local news initiatives that came out as some of the newsrooms closed. Some of those have done better than others. I'm like, but that's an experiment we need as a society to run to see if that can work. There might be some places where that's actually the optimal model, but I just think Access has built really great products and they've delivered on their, they have not lost their way and I continue to spend more of my day reading more of their products. So I think that's kind of what winning looks like to me in, in journalism, it's high retention, it's good open rates, it's good end user engagement and the ability to take your brand and expand the aperture without losing the trust of your reader. So Pam, uh, you've spent the last two years kind of in a whirlwind of M&A, so I just want you to tell me what you're evaluating from a you know, Vox and New York Magazine as that fit and then Group 9. Um, what was some of the metrics that you were looking at, or if it was metrics, what's the fit in terms of culture? What, what prompted all of that? Yeah, we uh, starting with the New York and Vox combination, um, there we saw a ton of, I guess, synergistic opportunity in um, across both the brand portfolio, like the categories that we were operating in, you know, New York had an entertainment site and a women's site and Vox did not and Vox in turn had uh, like a sports site and a technology site. Um, so there, the combination of the portfolio, the pieces sort of matched up without a lot of duplication. And then in the um, on the business side, you know, I talked earlier about diversification of revenue and how critical that is for, for our business, I think for many media businesses. And, and there too, there was this like, we'd each been pursuing a revenue diversification path outside of advertising, but um, leaned into different areas. New York uh, had a digital subscription product and um, affiliate e-commerce where like, our primary growth areas, um, and Vox had developed um, studios, meaning doing production for um, Netflix and HBO, um, Hulu, et cetera, and as well as podcasts, like those were the primary areas of growth there. So there too, each, you know, kind of the created ability opportunity to be places, for the other. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. and then so you're able to take affiliate to The Verge, et cetera. Right, um, and then this in 2021, we actually announced, I think five um, M&A transactions. The biggest was this Group Nine combination, but we also acquired a podcast company called Cafe Media, which is Preet Bharara's uh, podcast company, the former U.S. Attorney, the Southern District of New York. Um, also, a podcast company called Criminal. Obviously, we're seeing opportunity in in podcast um, where. We're, we're able, because of the, um, the scale that we'd already 
um, achieved in our podcast business. We're able to leverage both the the audience there to market additional properties. We're able to use our sales team to um, move outside of maybe the traditional lower funnel po um, podcast advertisers. Mm -hmm. um, we now our podcast advertisers tend to be brand marketers, um, and we, you know we get, we get a mix, obviously, but we're able to kind of bring a new advertiser set to those properties. So there's this like revenue synergies there too. Um, and then bringing on Group 9 uh, gave us more exposure. Primarily their, their brands include like Now This and the Dodo and really have enormous uh, social media audiences, um, which is an area where we were probably like a, a little, had been less forward, let's mm -hmm. just say. Um, and so that helps to, um, grow our mix without um, diluting our brands. Just a quick question on that. Do you still need Facebook to grow a media brand in 2022? I don't think you, no, okay. I don't think you do. I think um, having a Facebook for, uh, I think reaching a Facebook audience with a brand that will perform well on Facebook. That's significant though, I mean to say, you know, we, we've, we've come a long way if we can say that, I think. <laughs> um, Jim, do you have thoughts on that? Do you need Facebook? Mm -hmm. No, not at all. I mean, if you do, I think you're probably in trouble. That doesn't mean that you still don't get traffic from Facebook right. or that we all don't yeah. use it to do audience acquisition because it has the biggest pipeline of people in the history of humanity to target at a relatively low price compared to Google and LinkedIn and other people where you're trying to use platforms to accrue new audience. But you don't need them. And Facebook's a big advertiser for a lot of media companies. So. It, it, Facebook, where it was a huge threat and certainly hurt, uh, I think, the industry and certainly local early on, like now it's probably a net positive. That's a big swing, right? That's different. It's like a big, it's a big, it's a net positive now in terms of our ability to utilize the platform, putting aside the problems with what happens on the platform. Uh, just on the M&A point, you also all bought, uh, was it the Charlotte Agenda yes. over the last year? Um, let's just say you run a newsletter that's a niche newsletter that targets local news and you want Axios to buy you. What did that look like? How did you evaluate them? Um, and I bet there are entrepreneurs who would say, oh, I, I wouldn't mind Axios buying me. Email me, Jim at Axios. It's what Ted did. Uh, <laughs> We're pretty hands-on still. <laughs> like the, we don't do many acquisitions because I, I just find, like I, I think what makes Axios special is, is that we have this really interesting culture of really high achieve, high achieving people who are, are fun to work with. And it's hard if you bring on a lot of people, I think, at least the way we think about it, to, to maintain that culture. So when the due diligence that we did, Ted called me when I was hopping on an airplane, said, I have a company. This is how much revenue I have. I really want to help you do local. I'll sell it to you at what I think is a, a low price if I can help you. I said, sure, I'll let me meet your 10 people. And I, we just wanted to meet the people who worked for them. All of us met them, all the founders, a bunch of people. We basically did character checks. Mm. We didn't, that's the only due diligence we did. We did it on the people. And then once that was right, we did a simple deal and it was done in a week or two. Wow, it's amazing. Is, like, the culture thing is so critical. I mean, that it's, everything I just described is about like the business fit, but probably we spend the most time and attention actually on the culture piece too. That's what every panel at South by Southwest should be. I'm tired, running yeah. a company, I've now been a CEO for 10 years across two companies. Running a company today could not be more radically different than running a, a company yeah. at any other point in the history of humanity. What your employees expect of you, the way that you need to sort of think about messaging, the way you have to make sure people are burning with a, a feeling that you have purpose as a company is so wildly different than when I got into the business. And I'd say even wildly different than it was three or four years ago. And they should be teaching classes on this. They should, you should all be like, if you're interested in this stuff, if you wanna be a leader at a company, if you don't have high EQ, high emotional intelligence, if you don't have an ability to work well with people, and if you're not sincere, I wouldn't get into leadership or I would go through some kind of therapy and learn how to get to a point where you can pull this stuff off. Because you can't do it. It's just wild. Uh, and I think good. Like a lot of people would roll their eyes and all oh, these entitled young people and they don't think they should be CEO. I love it. I think you get. I think people are smarter than ever coming out of college. And I think they're motivated by better things than I was motivated by. I wanted a paycheck, right? I didn't want someone to hit me or fire me. That's it. And now kids come in and they're like, I want to take over the world and I want to stand for something big and I want to get to know the heart of this company and I want it to be transparent. I love that.
But you damn well better understand how to put together a culture that can do that, and it better be true to your heart. Like if I say I'm transparent or I'm sincere or I do the right thing when bad things happen, if I just say that but don't do it, I'm going to get ousted or you're going to quit my company. So you really have to start to think about these things. And that means that things, I don't, you, you've got to really start to get to know yourself in a different way. I think you have to think about philosophy. You have to understand how different people react. How do you make people who come from different uh, worlds uh, and, and from different ages, from different regions, from different races, different religions, and get them to all work together in harmony and synchronicity while also moving as fast as hell. I just think that was different. You could you could just move, you could throw money at people five or ten years ago and upside, and that would move them. That's just not enough, not in most spaces. It's totally, it's the number one thing I talk to the founders we work with about. And the ones who don't make it the number one thing, to Jim's point, are not <laughs> successful. So if it's not the number one thing I'm talking to a founder about in most cases, I'm worried that they're not spending enough time on the issues that Jim has brought up. That's, that's really interesting, though, from a funder perspective, that what Jim just said in terms of the emotional intelligence, how you're running your workplace is actually something you're evaluating against feels yeah. like another shift. I think for a long time, tech was an IQ business. Like, tech investing was just IQ, just like how good of an engineer, how technical are you, like, what are your quantitative skills? And I think it's changed a lot. Mm. And the pandemic, I think, puts such a premium on communication and empathy for founders, just understanding like you, you just because you see somebody on a box on a Zoom for an hour, it does not mean you actually know what's happening when the camera's off. Right. And it's a big deal. Hmm. And I think in digital media, we often take the purpose piece for granted just because if you're in journalism, you know, and I think the communication of that, Jim, um, that you reflected on is, is really important, constant communication on that. Um, we have a few more questions. We have a, under 10 minutes. So I'm going to try to um, go through as many of these as we can. Um, can we double click on monetizing from your most engaged fans? How do we see digital merchandise exclusive access evolving from here? This is from Jay Ez. Um, who wants to take that? I can start. You you were talking earlier about um, kind of segmenting the audience, right? And I agree with you that we're in <clears throat> the early stages uh, still of seeing that happen. Um, but I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, it's something, you know, where, for example, we have a high price conference and we, you know, so that's been a traditional business, but okay, how do you um, create community around that group more than just the once a year when people come together, just for example, and how do you um, create benefits for membership, subscription that maybe have more to do, you know, are very different than the traditional kind of like you're unlocking a piece of content sort of um, benefits. The uh, I think for for brands in a way like like ours um, in a different way like Axios too, where there's an emotional connection or identity connection to the product, where you're like, all right, I yeah, if I'm a person. I view myself as a person who values smart brevity and kind of business savvy, for example, then where are, are there ways to capture community around that self-identification? It's all interesting, but it's early. Hmm. More thoughts on that? I would just say one of the things we've seen is a lot of these super fans, they want access to things they cannot buy. And so it ends up, and I think, I was hopeful, but I've been disappointed that during COVID we would figure out how to make some of these really high quality digital exclusive experience. I don't think we've figured it out yet. A lot of them still feel flat, but we've had a couple of companies that are experimenting with like, hey, you're really into this sports team. If you're a super fan, you're gonna get the chance to go to a post game digital only interview with this player and talk mm -hmm. to them about like what happened during the game. And so there's a lot of things I see in physical. I'm like, you could, you could recreate that in a clever, well-executed digital way and give fans the same, mm -hmm. whatever fans, whatever it is, the same kind of exclusive access. And so most of the interesting experiences I'm seeing are more how do you create these intimate experiences for people with the people they care about, admire, look up to, or are passionate fans of, as opposed to things like, you know, subscriber-only merch or like physical items. Um, 
This is from Mustafa El Bermawi. We are past the Facebook feed era dominance over media. What do you think is the impact of the TikTok form of media on the media business? Axios TikTok, are you guys on? Uh, I mean, I'm not. I'm not Jim, TikTok I'm famous, nor am I TikTok <laughs> fluent. Uh, we do have people on staff. Uh, who are, I mean, listen, it's obviously like a massive uh, platform, obviously the most popular one for young kids. I check in with mine all the time. They're, it's much, I think it's displaced Snapchat. And Instagram is a place that they're getting a lot of their news, and so you have to pay attention to these. We don't tend to spend as much time as others do worrying about what's happening on these other platforms. We have a presence on all of them, including Instagram and a little bit on, on TikTok, but I have no way of monetizing that. And so when I think about the merch question or how do I get more from a super fan, it's about how can we provide more how high quality content into the different parts of their life where they need it, that we can monetize it in different ways. So like, like great, he's doing Parada, then we just did Pro. We have a whole uh, fleet of, of publications that are designed for people who are looking for deeper content, so maybe I can get a little bit more of your time on, on, on those. And I think that's the way uh, that we approach it. And by the way, that's how any smart company's doing. You look at what you have, and then you figure out what are the ways that I can monetize this in a way that potentially big. And so like, I don't know everything about Pam's business, but I think it's, I have watched them closely realize that they've got this constellation of, of brands and stars. They had a lot of success with, uh, with the Explain series, first on video, then selling it to Netflix. And now it seems like you guys have put together an entire production uh, company within your company. And my guess is you're making tens of millions of dollars selling and producing shows because they know the fans, they know what they want, and then they know that they have this pipeline to be able to bring people to these shows, and then they're able to put the bring a lot of that talent in-house to be able to produce it. Then it becomes a good business. And that's why you should pay attention to what everybody's doing, but don't get too worked up about what other people are doing. Try to figure out like what are the known knowns about what you have or what you want, and what do you have uh, what do you believe that you can deliver ideally better than anybody else, throw your energy into that. As long as there's a plausible short-term way to make money off of it, I think you'll do a lot better. So I promised moderation and moderation. So um, the panelists are going to do the last uh, kind of heavy lifting for me. We have three minutes. I want each of you to ask someone else on the panel a question. So Jim, we're going to start with you of Charles, just so you all know what's coming. Charles is going to ask Pam, and Pam's going to ask Jim. Jim, what do you want to know from Charles? Well, I'm going to ask Charles a question I was asking backstage that we didn't get a chance to answer, which is uh, Charles has invested in almost 300 companies over the last seven years, all at the seed round, not all in media. But when you do that, you have access to like just a ton of learning and life experience about what works and what doesn't work. Like, What are the things that would surprise us most about the attributes either of the people or companies that are the biggest telltale sign of success? Um, I'll just give you three things. One is, I think you would all probably be surprised by the percentage of our most successful companies that are have a single founder mm -hmm. or a single or a dominant founder from an equity ownership and control standpoint in the company. You read so much about teams. We have a shocking number of like solo founded companies that are doing extremely well. Uh, second, um, at least for our portfolio set. We've, most of our most successful founders, based on the size of their company, are first-time founders who I would describe as mid-level people in the companies where they work. They were not the CEO, they weren't even a VP, they were mid-level people mm -hmm. who I think probably left their company because they were frustrated by the amount of access they got. And the third thing I will say is the number one predictor of success in our portfolio is um, basically time to ship after you raise money. If you can get from um, pre-product market fit to launch product in about two quarters, the odds of you being successful based on everything we've seen are extremely high. Hmm. But it's a good example, if I can, like, a good example of why not, don't get too mesmerized with like one person's theory of the case. Because I was blown away when Charles said that uh, he'd do one founder. Because if you asked me and Charles had not spoken, I would never recommend doing one founder. No, it, it, because, and I'm biased because both companies I've yeah. done, I've done with multiple founders. I just feel like I would be so lonely and I'd have no one to talk to when I'm pissed. I'd have no one to <laughs> vent to. I'd have no one to have my back when things are going poorly. And yet Charles has said that most of his most successful companies are single founders. Yeah, so it's like right. take inputs from everybody, but take it with a grain of salt. Charles quick, to Pam. Quick one for Pam. How on earth do you think about resource allocation across brands with so many properties that are probably going through development, growth? Like how do you just 
think, is there a framework you have for thinking about that? Uh, Yes, I'd say it's a flexible yeah. framework, but there is a framework uh, which has to do with like where um, starting with the the brand first, mm -hmm. I suppose, and what the opportunities mm -hmm. are, and then what's new growth opportunities versus kind of like organic mm -hmm. maintenance. So that's um, and where we see business opportunity will like. Again, I referred to, for example, uh, The Verge moving into affiliate e-commerce mm -hmm. earlier. So that's an example of we are like, all right, we're going to put a stake in the ground, um, build out affiliate. Where does it make sense in our portfolio? Mm -hmm. The Verge is the next logical place. Like, we're going to really, like, create a team there, mm -hmm. a new team growth area. Um, <clears throat> but it can... Uh, you know, I, I think from a management perspective, then going back to like culture and communication and so forth, being as transparent as possible about the choices that are made is really, really critical because um, it, without that kind of context for teams, then, you know, you get into like, oh, why do they have this thing? And I didn't get the thing. Yeah. And um, it, you just want to, everything functions more harmoniously and ultimately, um, better, the results are better, the more people are in lockstep around like, okay, I understand why that thing happened. So we're out of time, but thankfully our last question is to the founder of Smart Brevity himself. Pam <laughs> <laughs> okay. to Jim, go for it. Uh, I'm afraid it's not a teeny question, but I'm curious, as, as you're starting to develop a paid subscription product, kind of like outside of the core in a sense, yeah. how, how do you think about resource allocation and talent allocation around those two things. Yeah, I mean, we think differently about subscriptions than other companies in terms yeah. of like we, I'm a big believer in both companies we did is to stay free as long as you can make money off of it on advertising because you can grow your brand and bring in a user base. And then what we want to do is then start a paywall with additive content. So basically the stuff that's free, keep it free. And then the stuff that's going to be behind a paywall, we're specifically interested in in people who can pay, you know, four or five, six hundred or more per year for content. So it tends to be professionals who need high end professional content from people who have true expertise. And that's now that has its own leadership team, it has its own reporting team, its own editing team, and it's additive, so you can do these things uh, simultaneously. I don't see us getting into the consumer brand, even though I know a lot of people are having success with it. I, I think we're pretty good at, at monetizing on the ad side. It, it doesn't work for everyone. It does work for us. And I like the idea uh, in terms of purpose of, of being free and, and making our content, which I think is quite good, available to everybody regardless of, of how much they make. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Thank you Charles. Thank you all of you for being here. Thank you. Great. So good.